Good morning. So let's wait until everybody takes a seat so people are coming in. So yeah, already another year passed. So I'm very happy to see again a lot of people coming here. Um, we had a, a lot of registration. We had again to close the registration. I know that for some people it was a problem. But anyway, I see that uh, everybody made it here. And also, that's why we introduce also uh, online, so people can follow us. There's a web streaming, so also for the people at home or at the office, welcome to our um, info day. So it's still January, so I want to wish everybody still a happy new year, and I hope that uh, we will have again a great year uh, this year, and hope that I wish you all the best in all the things that you undertake this year, and I hope there are a lot of hydrogen things in. <laughs> um, so 2018, I think for us, I mean for the hygiene sector, it was really a fantastic year. I think we cannot wish more, I would say. Uh, I say it was the hygiene year, 2018. And I can only hope that 2019 will be the same or even better. And I have to say the first things that I hear looks very, very promising. Because uh, last year we were able to to reach the um, energy ministers. I mean, we had the ministerial meetings and so on. So really, at the energy ministers, we really informed them about what is hydrogen, what it can be done. And recently, I hear also now more head of states talking about hydrogen. I mean, we had Macron very recently talking to his mayors in France about hydrogen is the solution and so on and so on. And we have also other head of states starting to talk about. And this is very important because that gives us, of course, also the political support uh, to, f to move forward with this uh, very clean uh, technology. So we have, again, our call. So we have uh, a number of very, very interesting topics which you will hear uh, today, uh, which um, I think is challenging. And you will also see that uh, some of these topics uh, coming from the Cities and Regions Initiative. And some of them, some of you, of course, you know very well, what the Cities and Regions Initiative is, but today we work actually together already with 92 regions and cities across Europe. I just signed last week with Dunkirk, uh, uh, or the, I mean, in the north part of France. They signed also an MOU with us, and we still get a lot of requests uh, for that. But you will see that from the regions and the cities, we got some requests, and also in the topics, uh, we integrated their requests as well. It's very, very important. So. Today is really an info day, so it's really time for you to ask questions. I would strongly recommend you really ask the questions. I mean, we have all the people here now. Uh, the whole team is here. Uh, they are the specialists. I uh, have to count on them. But uh, ask them the questions because it's a bit stupid if you go back home and you still say, oh, I have to have a question. I didn't ask them. No, use this moment here. Later on, of course, if you have questions, you can always ask them as well. Um, no worry about that. Uh, we are here to support you uh, to a certain level, of course. Um, but do not hesitate. Uh, at the end, I would just like to thank my team because, again, uh, of course, preparing the call for proposals is a, a lot of work, and we do that together with uh, our two associations, Hydrogen Europe, uh, the industry part, and Hydrogen uh, Europe, the research part. They always help us to flag what is interesting, and so, and that's why uh, uh, we came up with the topics today. But anyway, to my whole team, thanks for helping uh, to make these topics and also to set up today uh, this uh, info day. Today you will uh, be guided the whole day uh, from uh, Mirella. Mirella is my head of unit, and she's responsible uh, for also making the OPE and all the projects, so thanks for that. And we have our call coordinator, he is uh, Lionel Bayot, has also um, very much uh, responsible to organize this day, but also the whole call and handling with the call. So uh, these two people are really uh, doing an amazing job for us uh, to realize that. Um, so I give the word to Mirella now. So and enjoy the day and make good networking. That's important as well. Hi. Good morning. Thank you very much, Bart, for the introduction and for the nice uh, word to the team, indeed. Um, good morning, everybody. I see the room is getting full and full. I'm happy to see the room full. And please tell us if you don't hear or if you don't see. 
So just raise your hand. Um, also, good morning to the people online. Uh, I hope we have uh, people following us uh, through the web streaming and it's not nice to start by apologizing, but we are really sorry we cannot accommodate you all. We know we had to, to stop the registrations. We had um, too many registration and the room here cannot accommodate more than 150 people. So we are sorry for that and I hope we can f you can follow us online. I'll come later with some details on how you can get in touch with us during the day. Um, I'll just uh, introduce a few slides about FCSGU for those who do not know us enough, I would say. And uh, then a few words about the call. The rest of the details will come to, uh, through the day. Um, I'm Iralat Anasio, Bart already mentioned that, uh, and I'm the head of uh, operations and communication in the FCSU. Um, let me see if I can manage this. Not. Thank you. <laughs> uh, luckily, I have my angel stuff. Uh, just to introduce a bit the context, and this is the political context in which Europe is, is, uh, is moving towards especially energy. We know very well w what our uh, president of the European Commission was saying already more than three years ago, in 2014, uh, when the European Commission launched the Energy Union. That was a very clear statement that uh, energy in Europe, the whole energy system has to be reformed, and that can all be, be done with very clear targets by 2020, 2030, 2050. I'm not gonna read them, but just to mention that to, s to show how serious European Commission and also the Parliament and the Council are on these targets, last year in June, they reached a political agreement and they even made more ambitious targets for 2030. And they increased the targets, as you can see, to 32% renewables and 32.5% energy efficiency from the original targets of 27% for both. So they even put more ambitious targets by 2030 with the ultimate target of 2050 and probably you have seen towards the end of last year the communication from the European Commission on 2050 strategy. And the strategy and the target, it's a carbon neutral Europe by 2050. So this is what we have to do. We really have to act. And why I'm saying that might seem not relevant. No, hydrogen and fuel cell can play an important part in all of three objectives, all of three targets of the energy union. Why we can reduce the CO2, we can accommodate integration of renewable in more and more renewable, um, acting uh, hydrogen for uh, acting for energy storage, but also provide with the fuel cell an energy efficient, a very good solution, energy efficient system. Um, excuse me, I'm getting used to this. Um, who are we? We are a public private partnership, and the three members are uh, the European Union represented by the European Commission, that's the public arm of our partnership. And then we have the two associations, Hydrogen Europe Industry and Hydrogen Europe Research. Hydrogen Europe Industry uh, has right now about 130 companies and the particularity and the beauty of this association, it's about 50% small and medium enterprises. We are proud of that and in our projects you can also see that. Um, and on the research side, uh, it's, a, it's an association of about 70 institutions, research organization and universities in Europe. The objectives, not many, five, and very easy. They might look to, they're not so easy, but they are very easy. On the transport side, we work on the fuel cell to have durable, low cost, um, highly efficient fuel cells on the transportation uh, side, similarly for fuel cell for energy, while working on the production of hydrogen uh, with a high efficiency production from water electrolysis, and also working to um, show the feasibility of using hydrogen for energy storage, so that would be the fourth, with the ultimate fifth objective, while all doing that, reducing the critical raw materials. 
So this is what are we doing, and all of this in line with, you remember my first slide, with the energy union uh, targets. I'm not gonna go through this, but uh, you can also imagine what do we do uh, in achieving the five objectives. And on the energy side, we look at energy production, energy production, uh, hydrogen production, distribution, but also storage, and uh, fuel cell for power or combined heat and power generation. Uh, on the transportation side, we look at road vehicles. When we say road, you can mention cars, buses, trucks, non-road vehicles and machinery. One example would be the material handling vehicles, for example, uh, but also shipping, trains. Uh, re of course, the associated uh, refueling infrastructure and uh, we also have a cross-cutting type of um, area of activities where we look at, I sometimes call them support activities like education, awareness, standards, pre-normative research to, to input into standards, safety. And for that, in the, from 2014, uh, in, in the, in the um, second part of our life, if I can say that, We've, get, uh, we've gotten 665 million from the European Commission, and we expect this uh, contribution, at least this contribution from our members, Hydrogen Europe, Hydrogen Europe Research. What have we done so far? Uh, I mentioned our second life. Of course, we exist from 2008, and we were getting support from the research and innovation programs of the European Commission. First seven framework program and second Horizon 2020 right now. So far, we have gotten support of more than a billion and uh, we have committed so far almost 900 million uh, in these 10 years in 244 projects. You can see down, we already have in projects only the similar uh, commitment from our members. So a similar 900 commitment in projects. In addition to that, we are also looking at the private investments and according to our members, we have at least, we are expecting at least 500 additional million of private investments from our members additional to these projects. In the 244 projects, we have um, the balance between support to the different application energy and transport is pretty much similar with uh, a bit more on the energy side, you can guess why. On the energy, of course, we have three objectives in energy. You remember, we have the fuel cell for stationary, but also on the hydrogen production. So, of course, we have more support into that one, 47%, with a 42% support in, uh, to transportation. And the 6 and 5% is in the cross-cutting I mentioned to you. And we also count the type of projects, we call them overarching. I apologize already for the many acronyms you will hear today. Overarching is the type of project which covers both energy and transportation. So it goes from the hydrogen production, green hydrogen production, to the use of hydrogen in the different application being energy or transport. Now, that was everything on the introduction of FCHGU. For more information, please go on our website. You can find everything in there. Still, if you still don't find, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, Call 2009, and that's why we are here today. It has been published uh, on the 15th of January. You can find it both on our website, and from there you have a link to the um, funding and tendering portal of the European Commission. We are using all the tools of the European Commission. So for those who are already used to these tools, you might find that very easy. Lately, the portal has updated, but is sufficiently friendly still. So you, you should manage to, to, to get through. The deadline is on the 23rd of April. Please note that it's a very strict deadline. Um, it's five o'clock in the afternoon and it's really to the second. So please do not uh, count that you can submit proposals in the last minutes because it happened in the past and it, I don't know how, but it happens every year. 
that we get two or three who are submitting seconds after the deadline. Please do not wait for the last moment. The, those that arrive after the deadline, we don't even see. So this, this system does not accept that anymore. So please do not come back to us and complain because we cannot do anything. So it's an IT system, the way it's built, it does not accept after a second or a, a, a thousand of a second, it doesn't accept anything after five o'clock in the afternoon. Please start preparing your application well in advance. The system allows you to overwrite the application. So at any time you can update it. So do not wait for the last minute. Worst case scenario, we get the previous version, but we still get it. So please do that. Um, you will hear also during the day, we will guide you through the topics. The call contains 17 topics, the call for proposal. One thing I want to, to say here, I was thinking this morning walking to the office, do not only read the topic. I know this is important, you read the topic, every word matters in that topic, believe me. We've, we've read that and we've written that and it took us months. Every word matters, please read carefully the topic. But not only that, you might see some requirements which might seem a bit, um, I don't know, making no sense. Please, if you have the time, of course, please read the whole document. It makes sense if we ask, for example, that safety incidents to be reported in a database or uh, testing uh, activities to be done according to harmonization activities that we have done with our colleagues in the Joint Research Center. So all these requirements matter. Please read them carefully because ultimately, when the experts will evaluate the proposal, this might make a difference. So please read carefully. And if you don't understand, go to the rest of the document, you will understand why. Um, a particularity, I can say, of this call uh, which I would like to underline already, you might hear more uh, during the day, is the focus on international cooperation of this year. You might have noticed already from May last year in Malmo, a new innovation challenge has been created under the Mission Innovation. There, the European Commission is co-leading with our colleagues in Germany and Australia. So the three countries, the European Commission, of course, representing the EU, plus Germany and Australia are leading this innovation challenge, innovation challenge number eight, uh, and they have sitting together and taken the lead to uh, promote hydrogen around the globe. In that respect, European Commission wants to already open about six topics this year for international cooperation. We have therefore and you will read, when you will read the topic, you will see that collaboration with international uh, partners, international organizations from uh, mission innovation countries is particularly encouraged. What does it mean that? It doesn't mean uh, the proposal will get more points necessarily, but the way it's built might bring an added value. It's not part of the evaluation criteria, but it's a, a requirement of the topic. Therefore, experts will look at that, and if there are two proposals, one with international partners, one with not international partners, the international partners might bring an added value to the topic, so might get maybe not an extra point, but maybe a half a point. So I would kindly ask you to read all the requirements, and for these particular topics, please look for international partners. Again, you will hear, during the day from uh, Lionel, from the call coordinator. There is a facility also in the, in the funding and tendering portal introduced from last year where any company can express interest in a particular topic. So please look at the topic that you are going to apply if you're looking for international partners and look if any international partner has expressed interest for that topic you might find already the international partner there, if you already don't have your connections, of course. Um, I think 
with that, I finish my introduction and I go to the practicality with that I really finish my presentation. This is more or less the agenda. It has been already online, probably you've seen it. So briefly, we will have till 10.30 the presentation of the, of the call topics uh, by project officers. I'll introduce them in a moment to you. Um, then we'll take a break for a networking coffee. Just before that, we will open the floor for question and answer. So I would kindly ask you, hold your questions till you hear all the topics, and then we'll have a discussion just before the coffee. Um, then in the second part of the morning, we'll go into the rules, rules for participation, legal and financial aspects, lesson learned. You will also hear from our experience what we believe um, experts want or do not want. Um, and I will also come back to you to reinforce a bit to you the aspects on communication, dissemination, exploitation of results. We will take the lunch. Everything will happen in the hall at the entrance. So our coffee break, lunch will also uh, will happen there. We will never fit here in front of the room. And then we will split for a brokerage event. And uh, we have decided, based on your interest for the brokerage event, to split in three parts. We will split in energy, transport, and cross-cutting. With the Hydrogen Valley, which is a specific topic for us this year, to be addressed just before the lunch here in plenary. We have received a lot of interest for that topic, so we will address it here in plenary um, without having a dedicated brokerage event separate. And of course, at the end of the day, I hope to see still all of you for a networking cocktail. We have mentioned already the web streamed online. So for those at home, I'm happy to have you with us. We please use the Twitter. We have a dedicated Twitter account uh, for, for today. So please use if you are going to, to tweet about this day. And uh, one novelty, which we have, of course, started from, from last year with all our events, is Slido. Please use Slido to put questions. We will, of course, uh, take also questions in person, but please also use Slido to put questions, and especially for the people uh, who are at home. Please use Slido to put us questions. For the brokerage, you have already received, probably with your badge, a bit of identification of your interest. Also to help you for networking. So depending on the colors and your interest when you have registered, we have given you some colors. If you, during the day, change your interest <laughs> or want to have, please tell us, we will get you more colors. It's also easy for you when you talk on the corridor or during the lunch or during the coffee to identify uh, each other. I mean, our interest today is first to present the call to you, but also get for you to find new partners for the new applications. And uh, with that, I thank you very, very much for your attention. I hope I stick to the time. And uh, I wish you a wonderful day. I'm here with you anyway. So thank you very much. I promise I introduce the team. So <laughs> I introduce first uh, Erike Hiron, a project officer in the, in the program office. He will guide you through the transport uh, topics. Thank you, Mayra. Thank you very much. Um, okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Enrique Giron, as uh, everybody knows by now. Uh, I deal mainly with uh, transport demonstration projects, but I know only a bit about uh, research projects. I'm going to introduce you to the, to, the hydrogen, uh, to the transport topics, but I have to say one thing first. I have not done your homework. You have to read the topics. I'm just going to highlight a couple of points so that I give you the flavor of uh, what you are going to read. But please, as uh, Mirella has stressed, 
read carefully the topics because they include a lot of information and a lot of uh, small details that you have to keep in mind because otherwise you will not be well uh, assessed or well evaluated in your proposals. And I have to remind you, and I say it every time I do this presentation, the experts only have two documents, this and your proposal. So when, and when I say this, I mean the op, not my presentation, uh, thankf <laughs> thankfully. Uh, when they evaluate your proposal, they will have to double check it with the topics uh, as they are written in the OAP, and you have to ensure that you meet all the topic requirements. So what's uh, the main focus of uh, transport this year? And I'm going to go rather fast because I hope, I insist that you do your homework. Basically this year we have uh, gone back to non-road uh, transport uh, applications. Uh, we have had uh, in the previous uh, years, a lot of uh, projects on, on road transport applications. This uh, year, we're going to go back to demonstration in non-road transpo uh, non transport applications. In this case, we have uh, shipping. Uh, we are going to enlarge, so make bigger projects than the, the previous ones that we had in previous calls. But also, we are going to go back to an old topic of ours, which is uh, material handling vehicles, although with a different uh, focus. Uh, especially the, the most important thing about it, and I'll say later, is uh, we're going to do logistics and rather than material handling, logistic vehicles and, and you will see the, the difference. In research, which of course we have uh, not forgotten this year, we only have two topics, but we're going to approach one thing uh, that is important. We're going to go back to the basics uh, with MEAs, uh, basically understanding the, the, the mechanisms uh, behind uh, different processes uh, in the new MES that we have been developing in the last uh, wave of projects. And we are doing a all required uh, project, uh, which is a hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, drivetrain tool to, to better demonstrate uh, or to better de develop the hybridized uh, systems for transport. And last but not least, uh, HRS, we all know about HRSs, we have plenty of HRSs, but we have to keep on improving them and in this case we are going to focus on footprint uh, development. Um, I insist the hybrid, uh, hybridized uh, system platform I think is one of the most uh, relevant new things that we are dealing with. The focus on industrial sites for material handling vehicles and the underground uh, storage for hydrogen, I think, uh, are the, the main new things that you will find that uh, they're not being common so far. Uh, so five topics. I have uh, marked uh, the two things that are important, which is uh, the topics uh, which have a, a maximum budget because uh, I still have to remind you that uh, this budget is an eligibility criteria. When you have one asterisk, it implies that you cannot go beyond that, uh, that um, uh, funding requirement. So if your project requires one euro more than those uh, that estimated here, uh, then you will not be eligible, full stop. That's for the ones that have one asterisk. So the ones that have really an eligibility criteria with a maximum uh, fu uh, requested uh, funding. The other two asterisks <laughs> stand for uh, the topics that have a limitation, the number of projects that we are going to finance in that topic. So the, the budget here is an estimated budget. We hope that you don't go beyond that and it will be assessed by the experts that we consider uh, from the FCH that with that budget you should be able to do what we have asked for, but it, it is not an eligible uh, eligibility criteria. However, the number of topics are important. We will not fund more than one topic uh, in those uh, project in those topics. So let's go to the to the details. And I insist, I'm not going to. I haven't done your homework. <laughs> this is okay, good. I haven't done your homework. So please, this is just the highlight of uh, a few things that I have identified or we have identified as relevant. But uh, every word in the topic counts. So if we start with a uh, demonstration project, uh, the, um, the idea here, we have done some projects about uh, material handling vehicles. There has been a discussion about uh, whether they are uh, already being deployed in enough numbers uh, in other countries or uh, other parts of the world. But now we have to focus on the whole ecosystem. So we want to go into a logistic hub and really test all the material, hand all the vehicles that you might need, and that is not only forklifts, but it also includes vans or trucks, small trucks, uh, that are involved in the logistic of an industrial site. 
The idea here is to do it in two sites uh, and to prove different uh, modes in each, but there is a possibility also to have it in one site to, uh, to prove uh, volume, so to, s to show the, the synergies and, and uh, the, the my screen keeps on changing at the distortion, but sorry about that. Um, see the, the benefits of having uh, the full fleet of vehicles uh, changed into hydrogen. And here, of course, we are competing, and this is clear, against the uh, battery. Uh, so the other zero emission uh, alternative, which is battery electric vehicles. So we have to prove which ones are, uh, or what are the benefits of transforming, if not all, at least part of the fleet into hydrogen. Uh, the most important thing here would be, uh, of course, intensely used uh, forklifts. So this is for two, three shifts uh, of 14 hours per day. And uh, I insist there are a lot of there is a lot of information about what you have to do in this uh, topic uh, in these projects in the topic. The second topic is the one that needs the aster the the, <laughs> the mark for inter uh, international cooperation. This is about uh, developing <coughs> ships at larger scale. So the shipping industry has to has <laughs> taken an, uh, a compromise to go. Uh, zero emission, or at least reduce their foot, uh, their zero and their emissions, CO2 emissions, dramatically in the, in the next years. And here we are going to give offer an opportunity. We have done some topics in the past where we had a, a megawatt scale uh, fuel cells. Now we want to go to the two. No, this is the multi megawatt uh, fuel cells. We are going to two me two megawatt uh, watt fuel cell systems in the ships. The idea here is to prove. Not only the fuel cells, but also the the the, um, the fuel logistics. And why do I say fuel and not hydrogen? Because this topic is open to any fuel, uh, any fuel cell technology, with the uh, and any fuel. Therefore, with one clear idea is CO2 reduction. So you have to prove 70% uh, CO2 reduction compared to the incumbent technology, regardless of the technology you use. If you go for hydrogen, you also have to uh, prove the bunkering, how you would do it, not only in the ships, but also uh, in the harbors, and how you would uh, charge, uh, so all the hydrogen logistics behind that. Another thing that is very important in this topic is the scalability. You have to prove, uh, we are going to test two, two megawatts, but you have to prove how to get to 20, and you have to prove uh, also how to go to zero emission. What is, the, what is your roadmap to go to zero emission? There's a strong focus in this uh, topic about um, 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 permitting and, uh, and, and develop standards. Uh, so this is uh, another focus that should be here, and that's where the international collaboration wi will come into place. <coughs> and of course, there is uh, so regulations and codes and, and going, uh, f regulation codes and standards is an important focus here. And of course, we have to have some requirements, minimum requirements about how much they, they, op uh, they operate, uh, and so on and so forth. If we go into research, uh, the first one, if anyone understood this topic the first time they read it, they are much, much more intelligent than me. I think it's a very difficult topic to understand, so please read it a couple of times <laughs> because it's, uh, it's not easy to understand. The concept behind here is, okay, we, ha we, have, hydrogen, uh, we have fuel cells for, uh, for transport, but we all know and we are very well aware that uh, they are hybrid systems, so you have a battery, and a fuel cells, and to reach the balance, to see which is the right uh, amount of battery, what is the right amount of hydrogen in the in the in a vehicle, is tricky, and it's something that uh, requires some efforts. Here, we're trying to put a tool uh, forward so that uh, you can develop this easier, so you reduce your uh, development cycle uh, dramatically. This platform should have uh, the software, so the modeling part, but also the hardware to validate it. And it should be open for anybody to be able to hook into it or add. It's not only for testing the th uh, the, um, these two parts, so, so the hybridization, but also to, to be able to, uh, to test a balance of plant uh, equipment. Really, uh, it's worth uh, two or three reads because it's a complex project. And since this is a complex uh, project, the next one is not easier either. It's uh, about uh, t lower TRL. We are going to TRL 2. Uh, this is all about mechanisms. So we have done a, a big effort in developing uh, MEAs. We have had a lot of projects in the, in the, in, in the fuel cell, uh, in the FCH, to develop these uh, MEAs. And now we want to go for all these new MEAs that have come up with high potential because they have a high, um, uh, energy, uh, no, um, 
power, uh, power density, power density. They have uh, ultra low uh, platinum loading. They have very, very thin. OK, now we have to understand all the mechanisms uh, of uh, heat transfer, uh, um, mass transfer that uh, deal with them so that we can really improve them and use them properly. And this is the idea behind it. It's one of the topics that also Mark, uh, because of uh, low tier and we consider it is relevant to have uh, international collaboration. Um, and one thing that is important is that uh, we want OEMs to be involved in this so that we ensure that they, they test this and they use this uh, MEA knowledge. The last topic in transport yeah, uh, is one thing that we have not forgotten. So we are doing a lot of deployment in vehicles. We have uh, a lot of deployment in, uh, in hydrogen refilling stations and we have already done some research on different uh, parts of the refilling stations like uh, the compressors. Now we want to focus on one thing that we think is critical, it's the footprint. Why do we consider it? It's because now that we have put the filling stations, we want to put them inside the cities, and in this side, the cities, the, the, the space is critical to be able to integrate them. Also, another thing that is critical is not to have a hydrogen refilling station only by itself, but also integrated in a, in, a, in a station where you have other fuels, other alternative fuels especially, like natural gas or LPG, uh, or uh, of course not gas, solid and diesel, which we'll, I'm afraid we will have to coexist with them. So the idea here is to reduce the footprint is uh, the simplest or one of the most obvious ways is to do as the gasoline tanks have done, which is put underground the, the storage and then use the the surface to, uh, for other uh, uses in the station. This has not been tried yet. This has not been tested. There is a lot of regulation involved there, and we have to ensure that this, uh, this is possible. One thing that is important here is that the, um, you have to do a hydrogen refilling stations, but we are not going to pay for it. We are only going to pay for the underground storage. So the idea is you test this. You put the, the dispensers at least uh, for 350 and 700 bars, uh, one dispenser but we will only pay for the underground uh, storage, not for the, for the dispenser, compressor, uh, and, and other things. There are some other requirements here about the minimum amount of hydrogen that uh, has to be there, so please read it carefully as all the topics. And that's all for transport, but before I leave, because I'm, I like overarching, I've, uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be in charge of overarching, hopefully I will be able to deal with this marvelous project. I'm afraid I will not be able to tell you too much about uh, this overarching project because someone else, Carlos Navas, will explain it uh, in much more detail. If you thought that the previous projects were complex, this is very complex <laughs> because it involves a lot of things. The idea behind this, uh, without wanting to say too much, is, okay, let's go for, we have done a topic about hydrogen territories, now let's go big scale and show the potential of hydrogen in many <coughs> applications so that we show what we have always, or we prove what we've always said, that the uh, hydrogen is good at its application, but it's better when you have uh, uh, all the synergies with all the applications uh, between them. And as I said, because I, it will be explained much uh, more in depth, I, I will not uh, go any further into it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrique. Um, like I said, uh, please hold your question, but also use Slido. Questions are starting to come on Slido. Kindly ask you to mention the topic you are putting the question for. I already saw a question and uh, I can only guess <laughs> because we have only seen a presentation that it's, it's for one of those five topics, but please mention the topic you are putting the question or be more precise in your question because otherwise it will be very, very difficult for us to answer later. So, uh, next speaker is Nikos Limberopoulos and he's uh, also a project officer in the FCEGU. I give him the floor to start with the energy topics. Nikos. Thank you, Mirella. Good morning, everyone. This is Nikos Limperopoulos. I'm a project officer at the FCEGU, and I follow mostly hydrogen production and hydrogen for energy storage projects. With my colleague Antonio Aquilo, we'll be presenting to you an overview of the topics on the energy pillar. Right, so first part of the presentation will cover hydrogen production and the emphasis this year is hydrogen injection in the natural gas grid 
we have three relevant topics, two under the energy pillar, and of course, electrolyzers for hydrogen production. So this year, there are no other hydrogen production routes uh, than electrolyzers. Uh, what is new is that we are paying attention at injecting hydrogen at the high and low pressure natural gas grids, so transmission and distribution grids. We are going to be supporting the demonstration of the largest uh, solid oxide electrolyzer and also uh, research on anion exchange electrolysis. <coughs> so there are two innovation actions, two demonstration projects and uh, two research projects. Uh, topics 2.21, 224, and 25. You can see uh, that the budget for the innovation actions are um, an eligibility criterion, cannot be exceeded. Uh, also, only one project can be funded, while for the uh, research projects, the budget is flexible. Uh, only one project allowed for topic 2.5. Let's see the innovation, the demonstration um, topics. Topic 2.1 is a combined electrolyzer HRS and power to gas system. This is trying to address the chicken and egg problem of an HRS. You invest, you build the HRS, but where are the cars? Until the cars are to show up, you can produce hydrogen, providing electricity grid services, and inject this hydrogen to the natural gas grid. So that is the, the main uh, point of reducing the financial risk of an HRS investment. Any transport client could be addressed, cars, buses, or trains. Uh, it's a rather large electrolyzer unit, which is eligible for funding. Uh, and we are to be injecting in the low pressure natural gas grid. What is quite important is the co-location of the HRS with the uh, nearby a gas grid so that you are able to uh, access it and inject. And you have to ensure with local authorities that um, all devices downstream are um, compatible with this hydrogen injection. You will also need to liaise with the other two topics of this year's call related to hydrogen injection. You can see we're referring to high TRL uh, numbers in these two topics. The next one is trying to support European industry keep its leadership in uh, high temperature solid oxide electrolysis, looking at applications in the energy intensive industry. So. Um, there, we're looking at a large electrolyzer. The equivalent of a low temperature one would be almost three megawatt. In this case, it should be around two, 2.2 uh, megawatts electric. Um, also important is that the consortium will have to benchmark two different stacks at small power of 10 kilowatt and then decide which one to integrate to the final machine. The two research projects are seen here. Topic 2.4 is a new anion exchange membrane electrolyzer. Apparently, this uh, type of electrolysis has the potential to uh, enjoy the advantages of both PEM and alkaline, uh, but still it's at basic research level, TRL 2.4. So this project, which also allows uh, or rather supports the idea of an international collaboration. This project is looking at materials. Uh, eventually, a one kilowatt stack with five cells is uh, to be developed. Uh, the consortium should include an industrial partner that could go ahead and eventually build such an electrolyzer. The last research topic, two, five, has to do with injecting hydrogen at the high pressure transmission natural uh, gas grid. So there, the consortium will, lead, will need to develop a platform for uh, testing various components 
of uh, injecting the hydrogen, but also what stands downstream. Besides uh, testing that equipment, the separation, the hydrogen separation systems for low concentrations below 15% must also be uh, examined. And there is a strong component on uh, legal regulatory aspects, safety, etc. So I hope I rather quickly breeze through. You know what the rule is, study the topics in great detail. And I pass the floor to my colleague Antonio. Thank you, Nikos. And good morning, everyone. My name is Antonio Aguiló, and I'm a project officer at the Fuel Cells and Health Regen Joint Undertaking. So what's the focus? I'm going to be looking at what we refer to this year, Fuel Cells for Energy. We go beyond Fuel Cells for heat and power production as such, and you will see because we are looking as well at uh, reversible concepts using solid oxide uh, cell technology. The focus is two, as I see it. On the one end, I think we believe that we should still support to consolidate the European leadership on solid oxide cell based technology, opening up new market as well beyond heat and power production only. And we do that through two main things that, that are new, innovative polygeneration systems using reversible concepts and support to low tier level of materials that are adapted to operate in fuel cell mode but as well in electrolyzer mode. And then looking already pretty much to the end of the Joint Undertaking 2, we want to support also the continuation of the activities in some of the areas that research have uh, provided promising results. And that's on the validation of high temperature pen fuel cells and also at the demonstration of advanced diagnostics and control tools. We have uh, four topics, one innovation action. Uh, the innovation action has an eligibility criteria in terms of the maximum funding, so no more than three million can you apply, you can apply for funding. And then we have three research and innovation actions. The first two have also a maximum funding as an eligibility criteria. And it's important to understand that for all the topics, uh, only one project will be, will be funded. So the first of and the unique uh, innovation action I will present it's about developing, engineering, and building a solid oxide-based polygeneration system. What do we mean here? It's about a solid oxide cell-based technology that is able to operate first from electricity to hydrogen mode or when needed, and that will depend also on the, on the market conditions, electricity prices, time of the day, from methane to hydrogen, electricity, and heat. We are building on the concepts that have individually been explored in different projects, and here we are bringing that together as a system that offers flexibility for energy generation and for energy storage. Key elements, not unique, as it has been pointed out before, you have to read the topics. To give you an idea of the size, on electrolysis output, uh, we want to have more than 20 kilograms of hydrogen production per day. The TRL level at the end of the action should be six, and that's the second bullet point there. We want to see at least 5,000 hours tests in real industrial or mobility environment, and at least 20% in each of the operating modes. A large number of performance criteria included in the op. I don't think it's worth for me to go through them now, but have a look at them because your proposal will have to convince the experts that your proposal and your concepts are able to meet those uh, performance criteria. And important, looking at the market, you will have to also put forward new operational and business models. You will have to look at different end use cases and come up with new business models. And for all the hydrogen that is uh, being produced, you will have to issue guarantees of origin with the, with the system that we are supporting and on certified. Low TRL action, research and innovation action, looking at new materials, optimization of materials, historically used for fuel cells. Now, we want to see them that are optimized for solid oxide electrolysis mode, for co-electrolysis, and also for reversible solid oxide cell applications. It's about finding a compromise between the performance, durability, reliability, and costs. So it's about the next generation of cells and stacks, its materials, but also architectures. And you have to think about the scalability 
for mass production. So that's an important element you have to, to consider. Projects are expected to come with different materials, look at wider number of cells. Most successful will have to look at short stack testing, and only the most successful will be asked to look at test at the stack level of more than 5,000 hours. And because at the end the project is going to come up with solutions for industry as a whole, it's very important to see that the consortium has to include at least three cell or stack manufacturers involved in the solid oxide field, plus research institutions or academic groups in this area. And that's important because as you can see, this is going to benefit the wider industry. Now, we have a topic, we are supporting and we have successes in Europe for solid oxide fuel cells. Now we want to also support the research that we have seen uh, in past projects for high temperature pen fuel cells. This project is going to support the development, manufacturing and the validation of a high temperature pen fuel cells operating in heat and power mode of 5 kilowatts. Specific KPIs should be addressed and that's described in the op. One of them, as you can see, high electrical efficiencies are expected, 50 to 55 percent, and the system has to be validated in relevant environment. It's very important that the focus is not on the materials and on the stack. That was before. We have done that. Here, the projects have to focus at the system level. And this is why it's important that two fuel cell system core component suppliers and a system integrators are in the consortia. But why do we want that? Why do we want that? It's about the commitment to exploiting the results. So it's not just to develop something, but it's about showing with the consortium composition and through the activities, serious and strong plans for bringing the results to the market after the project finish. And that's a very important aspect of, of this topic. And finally, we want to see how we can increase the durability and reliability of stationary fuel cells. And this topic is proposing to do that through the integration of diagnostics and control tools. We have support a lot of diagnostics tools for projects. Here we want to integrate them with control uh, techniques and control tools. But the TRL level at the end of the project is TRL level 7. That's a demonstration, a system prototype demonstrated in relevant environment. So we want to see one year testing at least of the tool developed in an operational environment for at least two pen fuel cells and two solid oxide systems. This is about the control, so the fuel cell systems are not covered through the cost, so you cannot uh, put the cost of the fuel cell systems in, in, in your proposal, they won't be eligible. And you have to demonstrate extended lifetimes, availabilities and reliabilities thanks to the control tools. And the proposals have to quantify that. And I repeat that this is important because it's not always the case, so the proposals will have to convince the experts that you can achieve improved uh, performances with a set of KPIs that are in the op and that you will have to, um, to demonstrate. That's it on my side. Thank you very much, Antonio. We are getting into the time. Uh, so I now introduce the last speaker, not the last PO. We have uh, a bigger team uh, than this one. Um, Alberto Garcia uh, to, to present the cross-cutting topics. So. Thank you very much, Mirela. And hello everyone. Um, Cross-cutting is an is a activity area that facilitates and supports the market uptake. And this year we have a, a, the objective to ensure an effective response in case of an emergency in Europe related with hydrogen. But also we would like to provide inputs into standards for upcoming technologies. For example, medium and heavy duty vehicles, but also hydrogen admixtures in the, in the, nat in the natural gas. <coughs> we have three topics this year, um, covering coordination and support actions, but also research and innovation actions with a total budget of five millions. And unfortunately, only one project will be funded in each of these topics. The first topic is the coordination and support actions, and we would like to educate and train the first responders trainers to ensure that we have an effective response in Europe. To do so, we would like to build on high response training program with funded high response project backed in 2012. And we also, we would like to, to establish a pan-European network of training to replicate this training in at least 10 countries and in at least seven languages. 
we would like to share the best practices in this field. In order, so we would like to establish an international forum for fair responders. And we believe that the consortium should include five service institutions, partners with experience in using virtual reality for training and academic partners. Of course, we believe that also this project should link with research and educational projects, and we encourage you to look for international cooperation as well. The second topic is um, on refueling protocols for medium and heavy duty vehicles. So we would like to develop refueling protocols for any type of vehicles with compressed hydrogen storage systems above 250 liters or 10 kilograms. So we would like to, to develop this protocol or set of protocols to fill any vehicle with all these requirements. Please read the topic because there are many, many technical requirements. But also we would like to identify the factors limiting the refueling rate that there, are, there, that there is in the standards, but also to propose solution for larger float rates. The other objective in this, in this topic is to, to make a study on what are the needs concerning refueling protocols and storage technology for vehicles with great amount of hydrogen storage, above 50 kilograms. So, and to do so, we would like to make a review and a benchmark on, on different uh, dispensing systems to identify the most suitable storage technology, the boundary conditions for fueling, in order to ensure that we are preparing and paving the way for this, these technologies. We also, please read the topic because there is a, a requirement that the hydrogen refueling station should be available at proposal level. And also, as this is a pre-normative research project, all the findings and recommendations should be shared, not just with the stakeholders, but also with the standardization committees. The third topic is on hydrogen admixtures in the natural gas, and here we would like to solve the question on how much hydrogen we can inject in the natural gas. And to do so, we would like to see into, specifically in the, in the effects, on the effects of these admixtures on the performance and the combustion characteristic or characteristics of natural gas appliances. We would like to build on results from previous projects, so we expect a state-of-the-art review. We also uh, we would like to cover uh, many, many different appli appliances, different concentrations of hydrogen, and also different natural gas composition. We believe that to, to do this assessment, the project should carry on a desk research supported by experimental program to assess the sensibility of this concentration in the performance of the appliance, to evaluate the mitigation solutions in order to increase the acceptance of hydrogen in the natural gas, um, and also to identify new test methods and gases for the identification of these appliances. The test, the test should cover impact, uh, this should cover safety, efficiency, reliability, and so on. And as a pre-normative research project, the, all the findings and recommendations should be shared with the relevant standardization committees. And with that, I think that's all for cross-cutting. However, this is the last uh, presentation about the topic, so I don't want to miss the opportunity to, to highlight, as Mirel has mentioned this morning, that there are some additional requirements across the entire call. And in that specific um, sense, please keep in mind that we have a requirement. All projects have the obligation to provide information to the trust database. That Sorry. No. Does it work? Oh, there we go. <laughs> In order to do our technology monitoring, all safety aspects during, occurring during the course of the project should be reported to the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, who managed the Helen database. All testing activities, if your project uh, involves testing activities, should be linked with or cooperate with the protocols developed by the Joint Research Center. And also, if your topic applies, we have these guarantees of origin uh, certified green hydrogen, and we are going to encourage you to use it because we want to be sure that the hydrogen produces green, meaning renewable, but also clean, which means low carbon. And with that, I think that's all from my side. So, Mirela, thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. So, we've went through all 17 topics. Quick, I know. 
but uh, OP is, is big and like uh, my colleagues, project officers uh, reminded you several times, please read them uh, carefully. And like I said, if you have the time, I even encourage you to read the whole document. Now, I mentioned it this morning, please use Slido. We will also take questions from the audience, but I would like to look a bit at the Slido to see if we got any questions. And I would like to take that first. Um, I'm getting them. They are coming. Till the question from Slido come, let's take a question from the audience. Yes, in the back, please introduce yourself. Do we have another mic? Um, introduce yourself and uh, also tell us if you put a question to which topic you address the question. Hold a bit, we are coming to you. Okay. Yes? One single topic. It's okay. We can hear. Okay, and uh, so uh, just the, 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 uh, a few slides uh, ago, the, it was mentioned that there are some uh, general requirements for all the calls. And uh, when I read uh, when I read your call, uh, it's written that there is uh, you know some sections B and D about GRC contribution to safety awareness and uh, H2 safety panel. And for example, D.1, it's mentioned that there is support at the program level of the H2 safety panel, and uh, it, it's written that the, the, the safety panel is going to ensure that all projects address uh, stand, uh, state of the art uh, H2 uh, uh, safety, uh, which is treated appropriately. And d does it mean that all the, uh, all the, 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 the answer to the calls should include uh, an objective of safety or a state of the art of safety? Uh, or not, because some of the, 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 the call mentioned that and some don't. And so is uh, the safety panel going to be involved in the, the process of evaluating the, the, the answer to the call? Okay, that was my so question. So you have more than one question. Uh, anyway, uh, I will try to answer and you tell me if I did or not. First, uh, European Safety Panel, it's a group that we have created and that's looking at all portfolio of the projects we are having. Now, to get to answer to your question, if you are dealing with safety aspects, you make sure that you use some of the things mentioned through the call, and then it's for us later for the safety panel to look at that. Safety panel experts will not evaluate your project. Did I answer to all the questions? Perfect. Slido. Uh, we got uh, a question on uh, Hydrogen Valley. And that would be if B regional or multi regional cross border projects possible or even preferable. Uh, we can postpone it, uh, the question when we will address the valley, but uh, quickly, yes. And I think Carlos uh, later will answer to you in which condition. Of course, it has to be a valley. Yeah, not uh, different parts uh, of uh, Europe uh, that somehow are not connected could be considered a valley. But we'll get to that later. Um, the second question, please precise if it is and or, I am getting lost into the question, in one project, trucks and vans and forklifts, trucks or vans or forklifts, I think the end is the answer. If we I have to have, yes. If I may, uh, I insist, read carefully the topic, but basically here is to demonstrate various types of vehicles so these are uh, up to four types they are classified and it's an and it's a there is a minimum requirement of vehicles per type uh, and then there is so the overall is 250 but there is minimum 10 trucks minimum 10 vans minimum 50 forklifts so there is it's an and and there is a minimum uh, number of uh, per type of vehicle the scope of this topic, uh, if I can complement, is to uh, develop a logistic ecosystem into an industrial environment, so all the types of vehicles, okay? So it's an end, that's clear. Third question, at what date should the project start vehicle deployment? What should be the percentage of the vehicle deployment at the starting date? I guess it's for the same topic. There was no, there is no specification in the in the call, but there is a minimum requirement of time and hours, so you can do the cal back calculation if you want. Um, but the idea is that the the the, the, 
vehicles are demonstrated at least, I think it's 24 to 36 months, depends on the type, because they are w there's one of the type of vehicles that are lower TRL if you want, and therefore they are given a, you don't need to demonstrate that much, but the, there is a minimum demonstration and a maximum duration of the project, so you can do the back calculation. I like the next question. It's, uh, is it possible to draft the project starting with one fuel cell pro provider and change after one year? Really? Really? I, I mean, this is happening in our projects, I know, and we are totally against it. Why would I lose the money for one year? To start with one fuel cell provider and then change it. What did I learn after one year? No, it's a clear no, to my opinion. I mean, you might disagree with me, but this is the, the line of the program office. Yes. And not only that, this is almost cheating in the sense that uh, you prepare the proposal, the, eval the proposal is evaluated with a specific condition. Keep in mind in this topic that we enhance, and I didn't mention it, but please read the topic, uh, European value chain, so European uh, supply chains all over the place. Again, uh, you cannot, I mean, of course everything is allowed and we can change it, but we are completely against because you are supposed to prepare a, a, top, a pre um, proposal to answer the topic, it will be evaluated as it is, and we will sign it based on what you have provided. Life is tough, and uh, there are changes needed sometimes, but if you start already thinking that you're going to change halfway through, you're cheating. That's what you are, in a um, allowed way, but you're cheating. So please refrain from having that in mind. Then if life uh, happens, we will deal with the projects as they come. But that question is wrong. Thank you. Um, and the last call we got on slide, though, uh, for the call 1.2, that's maritime, according to my uh, memory, how is unit defining requirement 500 kilowatt per unit if the use of e-fuel is intended, how shall this be demonstrated? Who dares to, to answer? Yeah. I do dare. Um, in fact, the background of this topic um, the idea is to go for larger fuel cell system. Today we have projects running in which the fuel cell system is already at 600 kilowatts. So we need to go bigger than that. And what the shipbuilders are telling us, ship operators as well, that they need system of at least two megawatts to open the market for future use. But they don't want to have 20 tiny fuel cells of 100 kilowatts they need to have modules of already sufficient power. This has been defined by the uh, 500 kilowatt module that could be installed either for the propulsion or that could be used as well for the decentralized uh, stationary use uh, on board on board ship. The second question on the use of e-fuels. Yes, it is allowed, it's possible. Enrique, my colleague, has presented to you that you need to demonstrate the emission reduction, the potential of this e-fuel uh, in comparison with, uh, with other conventional fuels used in ships. Thank you, thank you. Now, because we still have time and I think we've taken enough slide, though, uh, I will open again to the floor. Yes. Please introduce yourself and be precise on the topic. Uh, Angelo Moreno, Enea. Uh, Athena, I changed. <laughs> I retired from Enea. <laughs> Sorry. Good Italy. Job. Um, I have one question, one general question on uh, international cooperation. Uh, I imagine that you have already rules for uh, IPR and uh, uh, do, I, uh, do they have to pay the, for their own research? Not or not? And for example, I can understand that in one topic where code and standards are addressed, this is simple to, to see how cooperation is. But for example, in uh, uh, the topic 1.4, where the development of new MEA is uh, uh, engaged, I imagine that uh, we have to know how to handle uh, IPR, for example. Do you have rules for this uh, international cooperation? Where? Of course we do. And you will hear in the second part of the morning uh, or from the IPR, from how we can support or not support international partners. These are very clear. Briefly, participation is open as always for anybody around the world. So participation is open and the, the motto of Horizon 2020 is open to the world. So participation is open to anybody. Funding, that is according to Horizon 2020 rules. Uh, Lionel will come later to that and needs if the participant is deemed essential 
to the action. Again, I leave the floor to Lionel, otherwise he will get upset with me. I'm, I'm, I'm spoiling uh, his presentation. I'm getting his, his ideas. So yeah, of course we have rules and on the IPR, I think uh, Georgiana, our lawyer here, she will also explain to you, we have plenty of rules on, on, on all these things. You will hear later. Any other question? No? Very clear. Or everybody's thirsty. 